All right. So let's get started. So we're talking about the curses. These are the signs that God gave uh, to be upon the seed of those who had not followed his direction. So you should be able to look around and find those people just by the sign. All right? All right, let's go a little bit further. He said, Deuteronomy 28, 6 through 61. I'm not going to do all of them because it, it, it would take up all that time to do it. I'm just make, trying to make a point. Uh, we can do an exhaustive study on it, you know, if y'all want to at some point. But he said, Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou was afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. He said, Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, then with the Lord will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. All right. Based on that scripture, let's look at us. Heart disease is the number one killer for all Americans, and stroke is also a leading cause of death. As frightening as those statistics are, the risk of getting those diseases are even higher for African Americans. The prevalence of high blood pressure in African Americans is the highest in the world. There's no other group of people that can beat us with high blood pressure. We got to beat Number one. African Americans are disproportionately affected by obesity. Among non Hispanic blacks aged 20 and older, 63% of men and 77% of women are overweight or obese. That's a disease. Y'all didn't know that. Did Number one, African Americans are more likely to have diabetes than non-Hispanic whites. In 2014, HIV and AIDS. The estimated diagnosis rate for HIV cases in the United States was 13.8 per 100,000 population. Watch this. And 49.4 among blacks. Y'all get that? Among everybody else, 13.8 out of 100,000 get diagnosed. Among us, almost 50. We are three and a half times more likely to get HIV and AIDS than any other group of people. African Americans accounted for the following. 45% of the total of all HIV and AIDS. 62% of the women. Y'all get that? We only make up 12 to 14% of the population, yet we account for almost half of the total number of HIV and AIDS cases in America. 62% of our women, 64% of them are, 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 are heterosexual acts. Because we don't have to be married no more to have sex. We just have sex. But we go to church. See, that's what I'm talking about. That's what, the, that's what Israel did back in the day. We lived any kind of way. And then we go to church. And we thought going to church was all that was required. <laughs> but he said, no. Nah. He said, if you were living like I want you to live, we wouldn't have a problem with the HIV and I AIDS. If, if you stayed at home with your wife. Amen. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I ain't judging nobody. I'm just saying as a people, I'm just saying as a people, we live like we want to live and thank God is good with it. But we show the evidence. All right. Then of the children that age 13, you know, the 64% of our children are the ones that are getting infected. These are our kids. They said that HIV and AIDS and, and, and chlamydia and, 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 and is so high in some of the black colleges now, they talking about shutting them down. Because we send our kids off to these schools and they get, you know, they get freedom. And if we don't, we hadn't girded it. It's hard enough when you girded up in the word to do right. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And we send them off and temptation is everywhere. All right. In 2014, 55.4% of all reported cases of gonorrhea. Y'all listen to what I'm saying again. We make up 12 to 14% of the population. Yet we account for over half of the gonorrhea cases in America. 
That's us. Syphilis, 38.1% of all cases reported to the CDC were among blacks. 5.4 times in that of whites. Hepatitis B, the rate of acute hepatitis B was highest for black non-Hispanics. Y'all think we're under the curse of Deuteronomy? 28. Deuteronomy 28, 43 and 44 said that the stranger that is within thee shall, shall get up above thee very high and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head and thou shalt be the tail. Y'all, y'all, man, I hear preachers preach. Boy, they be preaching. They had church turned upside down. Everybody was talking about we the head and we not the tail. We above and not beneath. Y'all, y'all are heard. Y'all heard. And so then, but when we come and look, no, we're not. No, we're not. The promise of being the head comes with obedience. It said currently a dollar circulates in Asian communities for a month. I mean, the same money. They'll, they'll spend money in the dry cleaner, and that dry cleaner will go spend his money at the at, the, at their restaurant, and then they'll go to their gas station and spend the money, and then they'll go to their own. That's what they do. And they stay in their community, they said, uh, uh, in the Asian community for a month, the same dollar. In the Jewish community, approximately 20 days. White community, they stay in their community 17 days. For us, six hours. That's us. And what makes it so bad? If somebody in here started the business, other black folks don't even want to go. Who he think he is? He didn't use my money to get rich. But we make our enemy rich. The one that hates you. One who making laws to destroy you, I'm gonna give him my money. See, that's how messed up. That's what the curse does. Deuteronomy twenty eight thirty two: Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fall longing for them all the day long. And there shall be no might in thine hand. Y'all, they were splitting up our children and families. I was reading a book. Uh, by this guy, he was a freed slave, and he was saying, "Man, he says awful." He said, "He said I would see brothers and sisters and children all come over on the boat together." And he said they would. Just, he said they could at least given them the dignity of staying together. If they were going to be in slavery, at least they would be together in slavery. He said, "No, nah, they just split them up." You know, and even in slavery, when the child was born to the mother, they would sell the child right from under. Then, you know, they would use, they would go steal the babies from the uh, slave women and use them as alligator bait. That's where the term gator bait come from. They would put the baby, take the babies and put them out near the water. And then when the, when the alligator came up and grabbed the baby, then they would kill the alligator. That's what they did. And it's part of the curse. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations where the Lord shall lead thee. Do you know there's a word nigger for every nation in this country about us? Every nation. Egypt. I've been in Japan, in Japan. China. Every nation in this world has a byword about us. There's no other people that. About that, and he said we would become an astonishment. People are so scared of us everywhere. I was at the bank, I pulled up, I wasn't thinking about nothing. I just going in and give me some money. And a little dude in there, and he was on little crutches. And he was he was at the teller machine getting his money. So I was uh, just standing there waiting on a man, this girl burst in the door. <laughs> like, what what is wrong with this girl? But she was protecting him from me. I didn't know that. She thought I was gonna rob him. I just, I just looked at it. I just shook my head. I ain't saying nothing. 
Well, I did say, I think I did say something. I said, well, you know, I guess that would have been two of y'all that have been messed up or something. Something to that effect. But, you know, see, that's why you got to let the Lord hold your tongue. You can't say stuff. <laughs> All right. And he said, therefore, shall thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst. And in nakedness and in want of all things, he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy necks until he have destroyed thee. Y'all see that? They parade us around naked. No dignity. On the slave block, naked. Women, children, everybody naked. If they wanted to rape you, they raped you. They did what they wanted to do. For hundreds of years, they did as they wanted to do. They took a survey not long ago, and this is today's time. They tell, asked the men, they said, uh, how many of y'all, if you could rape a woman and get away with it, would you do it? Don't you know that 70% of the men said they would do it if they knew that there wouldn't be no repercussion? Now, imagine the atmosphere that they were in. They could do anything they wanted to do. It was against the law to even sue a white man or bring a case against They wouldn't even hear it. They did what they wanted, when they wanted. Imagine that. Men had to see their wives. That's in the Deuteronomy 28 too. Had to watch their wives lay with somebody else. Part of the curse. He says, the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eyes shall be evil toward his brother. You wonder why we hate each other? He said, that man is tender. Now, the man with the gun is the one that's tender. What tender means when you look it up in the scripture, it means he can't take much. He can't, he can't take much. Any little thing set him off because he's tender. Tender, you tender hard. You know, you tender hard. I look at you funny. You're ready to fight. You approach me the wrong way. Wear the wrong color, I'm going to shoot you because I'm tender. See, it takes strength, believe it or not, not to act out in your flesh. Meekness is strength under control. Y'all with me? If I just allow my flesh to do everything I want to do, go off on you, cuss you out, say anything to you, that's not strength. But we define that as strength. We define somebody pulling the gun out as being strong when actually they're the weak ones. He said they would be tender, and his eyes shall be evil toward his brother. That's where we're at. If one person started getting up, we pull them down. And he said, Yahweh shall bring you into Egypt again with ships, and there you shall be sold into your enemies for slave men and slave women. Hmm. So we were brought into Egypt again with ships. Down the Nile River, we were brought it back into Egypt. And then, he said, from Egypt, you're going to be sold to your enemies. Who are the only people who were sold from Egypt? I mean, from, from Egypt, from Africa? Us. He said, unto all the nations, to a nation, that strange nation, that you wouldn't understand their tongue, wouldn't know what they're talking about. He said, I'm going to say you into all, we're the only ones that fit that. All right? Well, let's look at the ones who say they are Jews, but are not. In Revelation 2 and 8, he said, Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write these things, says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. He says it again. In verse 9 of Revelation Three, he said, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and know that I have loved thee. He talks to two churches about this because he knows that only two churches are going to get it. Two churches are going to accept this. These two churches that he talked to, Smyrna and Philadelphia, are the only two out of the seven churches that God doesn't have a problem with. He didn't have a rebuke to these two churches. Not one. The other five, he had an issue with. He had an issue with the first church. 
He said, because he said, uh, man, y'all do good stuff. Y'all, I'm just going to throw a little embellishment. Y'all pray good. Y'all do a lot of good stuff, feed the poor. Y'all do a whole lot of good work. He said, but I got a problem with you. He said, you have forgotten your first love. He said, so I need you to repent. That's what he said. Because you putting God's work ahead of God. Did you know we could put God's work ahead of God? Y'all remember when Mary and Martha was with Jesus and Martha was cooking and she got mad because Mary was sitting at his feet. And Jesus looked at Martha and said, Martha, Martha, you are come to buy with many things. He said, but Mary has chosen the better part. See, the best part is being at his feet. This ain't the best part teaching. The best part is at his feet. The best part is having a relationship with him. He said, come sup with me, man. I, just come sit at the table with me. I'm knocking at the door, and I want you to come talk to me so I can reveal some information to you, so I can build you up and make you strong and, and help you to endure the things of life. He said, I'm knocking, but I'm not going to force my way in. Just, just come and eat with me for a little while. And all them issues that you have may not seem quite as big once you leave. All them demons that you're fighting, maybe I can chase some of them off for you. But no, five out of seven, he had an issue. And he said, if you don't repent, he said, I'm going to move your candlestick out of this place. In other words, you're going to lose reward. All right. So let's look at the, should the Jews today, the ones who claim to be Jews, should they fit the curse? According to their own teaching, should they fit the curse? Let's see what they teach. Now, they say that the Talmud, which they go by, the Talmud, the Mishnah, and all that type of stuff, supersedes the Old Testament and authority for the Jews. This is what they say. This is our book over the Old Testament. It's not a dispute. Now, listen to what they say in their book. Whoever disobeyed the rabbis deserved death and would be punished by being boiled in hot excrement in hell. The number one, Jesus said, call no man your rabbi. If a Jew is tempted to do evil, he should go to a city where he is not known and do the evil there. I mean, you live in Anthony. Don't do it in Anthony. Everybody know you in Anthony. Go to Atlanta. Get your freak on in Atlanta where don't nobody know you and come on back. That's scripture, right? All right. A Jew need not pay a Gentile, a Kutian, the wages owed him for work. Jews may steal from non Jews. If a Jew finds an object lost by a Gentile, it does not have to be returned. Jews may use lies to circumvent a Gentile. Yeah. These are Ashkenazi, yeah, Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, it says in that, that book that Jesus' mother was a whore. She was the descendant of princes and governors, played the harlot with carpenters. And she also said that uh, Jesus' mother, Miriam, which is a real name, is not Mary. The Hadra is a hashtag many men. Then he called Jesus Balaam. And has thou heard how old Balaam Jesus was? Now he's equating Balaam and God. And Jesus. All right. He said Jesus was a sorcerer. He was executed because he practiced sorcery. He said Jesus is being boiled in hot excrement. Y'all know what excrement is, right? That's why we got a sewage plant to handle our excrement. Okay, I just want you to understand what they're saying. Listen to this. A Jew may marry a three-year-old girl. Well, she got to be three years old in a day. You got to have that day in it. A Jew may have sex with a child as long as the child is less than nine years old. When a grown-up man has intercourse with a little girl, it is nothing. A woman who has intercourse with a beast is eligible to marry a Jewish priest. A woman who has sex with a demon is also eligible to marry a Jewish priest. Come on, y'all. I'm just showing you what they books say. All right? 
So if this is if they are the real people, should they not be under the curse? Are they following the ways of God? So really, what God said, he said, if you don't follow after me, if you're the people, these curses kick in. And they're going to follow you everywhere if you're the people. Well, let's see if they're the people. It said, the stranger that is within thee shall get above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. This is just a few of the, of the places that the Ashkenazi Jews own, the ones who are claiming to be Jews. Look at that. Like, you can't get them all. It, it was a list of like uh, over 500 that I couldn't, I couldn't get them on all. I just had to put a few up there. Pretty much everywhere you go and buy stuff, they own by Ashkenazi Jew. Are they the tail or the head? Right now they're the head. <laughs> this is just a few. Are they the head? Is the stranger over them? They own all of the news media. 93% of the news media. Ashkenazi Jews own the media. They own a majority of the sports team. New York Giants, Atlanta Falcons, all of the four, four teams that we cheer for and all that stuff. They own them all. So they own the news stations, the newspaper. They own uh, all, all of the sports team. Everything that we're involved in, they own it. And then the banks. They are in charge uh, and, and over all of the banks, the big banks of the world, except for a few. I'm going to show that to you. They control the money. Are they the head? Are they lenders or borrowers? If they're under the curse, they should be borrowers, right? According to Deuteronomy 28. Jewish Americans are the most powerful and influential ethnic group in America. They make up only 2% of the population, yet comprise 40%, 40% of U.S. billionaires. 18% of Jewish households have a net worth of $1 million or more. More than 55% of all Jewish adults receive a college degree and 25% earn a graduate degree. More than 6% of all employed Jews are in one of the three highest status job categories, professional or technical, 41%, management and executive, 13%, and business finance, 7 Over 45% of the large gifts made to charity are made by Jewish Americans, and they only make up 2% of the population. All right. Who are they? Well, you get the tracing this stuff back. They used to call themselves the serpent people. The serpent people. Who called themselves the serpent people? All right. He said, from the early centuries of the first millennia, the Khazars of Eastern Europe were known as the diabolical serpent people. And now the nation of Israel has admitted that its people are indeed the Khazars. I know that. See, that messed me up too, y'all. I ain't, you know, so that kind of messed me up because I was all about, you know, you bless Israel and do all this type of stuff. Not knowing this Israel right here. All right. This guy, uh, Arthur uh, uh, Kessler, he was a uh, Jew too, but he, he came out, man, they came out to this dude so hard. They believe they killed him, but he said the large majority of the surviving Jews in the world are of Eastern European descent. He said, and thus perhaps mainly of Khazar origin. If so, this would mean that their ancestors came not from the Jordan, but from the Volga, not from, the Can- not from Canaan, but from the Caucasus once believed to be the cradle of the Aryan race and that genetically they are more closely related to the Hun, uh, Uber, and uh, Magyar tribes than to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. This is in their own dictionary. I'm going to read their dictionary to you. So... It said, the primary meaning of Ashkenaz and Ashkenazim in Hebrew is German and German. This may be due to the fact that the home of the ancient ancestors of the German is media, which is the biblical Ashkenaz. Krauss is of the opinion that in the early medieval ages, the Khazars were sometimes referred to as Ashkenazim, 
about 90%, 92% of all Jews, or approximately 14 and a half million, are Ashkenazim. This is in their dictionary. This is their encyclopedia. I mean. Their own encyclopedia. That's the universal Jewish encyclopedia. Let's go to another. Encyclopedia Americana. It says, the Ashkenazim are the Jews whose ancestors lived in German land. It was among Ashkenazi Jews that the idea of political Zionism emerged, leading ultimately to the establishment of the State of Israel. In the mid late 1960s, Ashkenazi Jews numbered some 11 million, about 84% of the world's Jewish population, Encyclopedia Americana. All right. Then it says, in the 8th century, its political and religious head, as well as the greater part of the Khazar nobility, abandoned paganism and converted to Judaism. The Khazars are believed to be the ancestors of most Russian and Eastern European Jews. The Jewish Encyclopedia. Encyclopedia Judaica, 1970. The Khazars are a national group of uh, general Turkic type independent and sovereign in Eastern Europe between the 7th and 10th centuries CE. During part of this time, the leading Khazars professed profess Judaism. It's in their own book. There was a war going on between Islam and Christianity. And you were going to convert to one of them because the Catholic Church was in charge of the war on the Christian side and the Muslims was in charge of the one on the Muslim side. And both sides would didn't mind killing you. And whichever one got to you first, that's the one you better convert to. They got to the Khazars and Khazars said, no, nah, we're going to be, we don't want either one of them, we're going to be Jews. Khazars according to the Jewish Encyclopedia, are a non-Semitic. What's Semitic mean? From Shem. Semitic means Shem. You remember we go back to Ham, Shem, and Japheth, the three that came off the boat after the flood. And anytime time you see Semitic, that means they came from Shem. But they're non-Semitic. Didn't come from Shem. If they didn't come from Shem, they couldn't come out of Abraham because Abraham came from Shem. Isaac came out of Abraham. Jacob came out of Abraham and Isaac. And then the nation of Israel came out of Jacob. So if they, can't, if they didn't come out of Shem, it is, it's impossible for them to be the children of Israel. They come from two different genetic lines. One from Japheth and one from Shem. So these are imposters. Why would they call themselves? The, see, there's another one right there. Another definition of who they are. Saying the same thing. Now, this is where the Khazarian capital was. This is modern day Turkey. So they went north and they settled out in Khazaria. Now, I'm going to show you some stuff about Turkey that might, you might not know. All right, let's look at. Uh, you can learn a lot from looking at the names in the Bible. You know, we, we like to skip over the names, but the history is in the name. And it says, the sons of Japheth had Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshach and Terah. And the sons of Gomer were who? Ashkenaz. The same name as the Ashkenazi the Jews. And they've admitted that they don't come from Shem. They come from Japheth. And the name is written in the book. Magog, Tabul, Targama, Meshach, all in Turkey. Synagogue of Satan started in Turkey. You go to Revelations? Well, let's look at the seed of Satan. Your Revelation 2 and 13 says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Y'all know where Satan's seat was? It was in Turkey. It was the altar of Zeus. It's where they went to worship their God. This was where the seat of Satan was. And then Jesus comes along. He said, all right, I'll tell you what. 
I'm going to start my first seven churches right where your seat is. And he put all seven churches in Turkey. All right. Let me, let me give you this little background. Jesus knew he was about to be crucified. And he took his disciples to a place in Israel where they also worshiped Satan. And he stood at the foot of Mount Hermon and he asked them, who do you say I am? Because there's a dilemma between who the real God is because all these people worshiping Zeus. Here I am. Who do you say I am? And Peter looked at him and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. He was at the foot of Mount Hermon. This is the place where, uh, 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 when you study the scripture, this is the place where the angels rebelled against God, came down onto the earth. This is Mount Hermon. He said, Who do you say I am? And when they admitted, he said, Well, Peter, little rock, upon this rock, talking about where Zeus' altar is. I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell that's right here, right now, will not be able to prevail against it. I just want to give you a, a bigger view of what he was saying right there. He went into Satan's territory and declared who he was in Satan's territory. Now you're talking about you're talking about stirring up the demon world at that time. Them demons got all stirred up. It wasn't long after that that Jesus was killed, but that was part of the plan. I'm going to stir these suckers up. I'm going to make them think that I'm going to just come take over like they think I'm going to take over. I'm going to let them kill me because, you know, I laid my own life down. No man taking my life. I laid it down. And if I lay it down, I'm coming back and I'm going to pick it back up again. It was part of the plan. And so not only that, after he had got back up, he went into the seat of Satan and established seven churches. The kingdom of heaven suffered violent, and the violent take it by force. He was making a statement. All right, another group of people that make up the other 20% of the Jewish population are the Sephardic Jews. Okay? They claim Semitic uh, descent from Esau. That's Jacob's brother. But it's also believed that they are of the... You remember Esau got mad at his parents and he went and slept with a lot of the Canaanite people. The Canaanite people were cursed people and he had offspring from the Canaanite people. So it's also believed that these people, not only are they from Esau, but they are also from Canaanites, a mixture. But you know Esau and, and, and Israel are at odds with each other, right? All right. All right, let's see where they came from. When Assyria went in to uh, dominate the top ten tribes of Israel in that, in that captivity, they possessed the land. They possessed that whole northern land that Assyria did. And so they wanted to go in and be able to live there. So they tried to go in and live there, but the Lord sent lions here and chased them all out. They couldn't live there because the Lord would only allow people who were doing certain things the way he wanted them to do it to live in that land. So what they did, they uh, got, went out and got real Hebrew priests to bring them in to teach the Sephardic people that Assyria had brought in how to do the rituals and stuff of Judaism. And so they taught the, the uh, Sephardic Jews how to become Jewish, basically. But they never really truly followed Judaism. They mixed in all the paganism and stuff along with that. But they were able to stay in the land because they practiced some form of Judaism. So he allowed them to stay. These are the same people that were still there when Jesus came. Because uh, the Romans had put, took some of them and put them in charge of the priesthood. Y'all remember when you read scripture, there's two high priests. One of them they had put down, they had put their own high priest in there. And it's believed that many of the priests that were in the, uh, in the fold were from this group. All right? And so that's, uh, and it's in the scripture, he said, uh, uh, let me see, which one is it? Yeah, it says, so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them which slew slew some of them 
Wherefore, wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the city of Samaria know not the man of God of the land. So he's, he's talking about what we just talked about. And so they went out, and then in verse 29 he says, How be it? Every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places, which Samaritans had made every nation in their cities which they dwelt. So everywhere they went, they put the, not only were they trying to worship Yahweh, but they were putting their own images up too. All right. Jesus comes along. Some of these same people are in charge. And they're trying to destroy him. And they answered and said, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, <laughs> listen to what I'm saying, you would do the works of Abraham. He said, but now ye seek to kill me, a man that had told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. They argued with him. He said, he said, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came forth from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? You are of your father, what? The devil. There are a group of people who call themselves Jews, but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. You are of your father, the devil. And they label themselves the seed of the serpent, the serpent people. I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragon of the wilderness. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Why would God say he hated anybody? He hated the spirit in Esau. He's, Esau loved himself so much and his flesh so much that he gave away his hair inheritance for some soup. That's akin to us giving up our salvation for a Snickers bar. My eternal promises. The guy that, that he died for, that he was bruised for, that he went to hell for, he was beaten for, so he could bring me back in the fold. And I look at him, and, and, and I say, no, nah, that's all right, I want the Snickers. That's what, that, that's what he did. That's the spirit of the enemy. Where is Lucifer's seed? Let's go back to what my brother was talking about. Follow the money. You want to know where the, you don't know where the seed of Satan is? follow the money. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. So how is that? I don't understand. How can the love of money be the root of all evil? Well, let's go look at Lucifer. He's the father of all this stuff, right? Let's see what Lucifer did before he tried to destroy creation. He said, man, he said, that was in Eden the garden of God, every precious stone was our covering. He names all the stones. He said, he said, uh, thou art the anointed chair that covered, and I have set thee so that thou was up on the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy way from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Now watch this next line. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Y'all, y'all look at the word merchandise. While he was in authority in heaven, with all of the other angels, he was merchandise. He was trading. He was trying to get control. And from the, in, 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 you know, it was, it's, it's insinuated here that amongst all of the other angels, those, those one third that he convinced to come with him, he had something on them. He had tricked them out of their place and received it for himself. Either he did it violently or he did it by trade. That's what that scripture is saying. So it started in heaven. And by the time Satan or Lucifer was through with his finagling, he had, he had a third of the angels either convinced them by his beauty that he was the one they should follow or he had some on them that they had to follow. That's dude slick, ain't he? Yeah, so how did he, how did he- well, that's a good question. When you when you look when you study scripture, 
and you look at the first two verses in Genesis, it says, you know, in the beginning, uh, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth became void and without form. And then it said, God's spirit moved over the face of the earth. And he said, let there what be light. And he said, he separated the light what from the dark. Okay? Okay, well, that, that makes some sense. Kind of. Then you go to John, the first chapter. And he said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. And the word was with God. So he's, he's going back to Genesis 1 again, except he's doing it in a different way. He's letting you know it's the same God that came to the earth. It's the same God that was there in the beginning. And he said, without him was not anything what made that was made. In him was life, and this life was the light of men. And he said, and the light shined in darkness, and the darkness, what? Comprehended not. Listen, Satan had already fallen. He had tried to take over the throne. He got kicked out of heaven. He had tried to destroy the earth. And God moved over the face. And he turned his glory out. That tells me that God was so smart. That he didn't allow Satan to see him in all his glory. That he allowed Lucifer to be the prettiest thing in heaven. Y'all listen to what I'm saying there. There's proof of this. Because... Scripture says Satan didn't understand it when he saw God's glory turn on. What did Jesus say about how he looked? He said, we just saw that Jesus was not an attractive man. But he said, but if you've seen me, what? You've seen the Father. So his father was not, compared to Lucifer, an attractive God. And he didn't show all his glory. So when you looked at him, it don't look like much to me. Look at me. Y'all get what I'm saying? Because one of the identifying markers uh, of whether you fall in the spirit or not is that I either look on the outside or I look on the inside. And when you look on the outside of things, you can get deceived. Because Satan dressed up real good. And it's not until you get on somebody's inside. See, he had two-thirds of the angels that looked on him on the inside. And when he kicked Satan out of heaven and he said he turned the glory on, he said, and his glory, Satan's glory, couldn't compare to God's glory, he said he couldn't comprehend it. He comprehended it not. And the reason I know it's God's glory because it was on the first day that he said, let there be light. That he turned the light on. But it wasn't until the fourth day that he created the sun, the moon, and the stars. We ain't talking about that light. We are talking about his glory. He didn't allow, he was so smart, he didn't allow Satan to see that. That's all, that's a good question, all right? So he, uh, this is uh, in Isaiah 14, it tells you his heart. He said, he said, you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So, these are the characteristics of Lucifer. So his seed will have the same. They're going to want to be in charge of everything. It's going to be about how you look. They're going to try to take over by any means necessary. They don't care. To be in charge. Now watch. All right. This is Rothschild. I'm sure y'all heard of the Rothschild. This is one of the most powerful families on the face of the earth. And they got cousins and the wealth of they own pretty much the whole world. Believe it or not, they own the whole world. And, and when you go back and study how they've done it, man, it's been shrewd how they've done it. You realize every war that's been fought in America was because of them. When you study it. But they behind the scenes, you don't really know it. He said, let me issue and control the nation's money. He said, I care not who writes the laws. And his son's like, I care not what, what puppet is placed upon the throne of Britain, of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire, and I control the British money supply. These are Ashkenazi Jews. Now. These are Ashkenazi Jews. This is the mom. If my sons did not want war, there would be none. So she's just letting you know they're in charge of every war that ever came. If they didn't want it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. I can't remember which, which dictator they fired. I got to go back and look at my books again. They, 
it was either Stalin or one of them. I mean, this guy was gruesome, killed millions of people, and then they got tired of him, they went in and fired him. How do you fire a dictator? You think that if a man got that much power killing millions of people, can't nobody tell him anything. They, they fired him, put in another dictator. That's how powerful they are. All right. Andrew Jackson was a general after the, uh, eight, the War of 1812. The War of 1812, couldn't figure out why we fought that war. Nobody knew why we fought that war. Historians are confused about why we fought that war. And it's because the United States was resisting allowing their banks to come into the United States. England was already controlled by them, as you saw. And they were trying to get control in the United States. And so they fought this war, put the United States in a position to where we had to borrow some money. And so they was able to, once we agreed to let the banks come in, the Ashkenazi banks come in, then the war stopped. Well, General Andrew Jackson was a, was a general in that war. So he became president later on. And his goal was to get them out of this country. And he said, the bold effort... Uh, the present central bank has made to control the government are but premonitions of the fate that await the American people should they be deluded into a per perpetuation of this institution or the establishment of another like it. He said, man, we're going down if we allow these people to come in and control them. All right. So he, he in 1836, uh, he vetoed a bill that would have renewed the nation bank charter, which expired that year in his veto. And he, he said, I'm not going to let it happen. When he got them, got rid of them, they tried to kill him. There was an assassination attempt on his life. The guy picked up a gun, tried to shoot him. The gun locked up. Pulled out another gun, tried to shoot him again. That gun locked up. So he took his cane and knocked the gun out of his hand and beat the dude up. They never did prosecute that man. He said, the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. They said, what was your biggest achievement? And he, without hesitation, said, I killed the bank. He said, he told them, you are a den of vipers and thieves. Y'all remember those words? Yeah. He said, I intend to route you out, and by the eternal God, I will route you out. Benjamin Franklin said that the, 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 uh, the American uh, Revolution was really not started because of the tea tax. It was started because they wouldn't allow the United States to print their own money. The Ashkenazi Jews wouldn't allow it. So what did they do? They went to war. This is what he said. He said, that, I'm going to read halfway through. He said, the inability of the colonists to get power to issue their own money permanently out of the hands of George III and the international bankers, the Ashkenazi Jews, was the prime reason for the Revolutionary War. Thomas Jefferson said, I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. Lincoln. Tried to fight the bank. They asked him who was his two greatest enemies. He said, I have two great enemies. The Southern Army in front of me and the bankers in the rear. But guess, guess who owned most of the slaves in the South? Ashkenazi Jews. The North was losing that war, y'all. The North was about to go down. And then Russia sent over one of their uh, uh, czars, sent over some ships to help them fight. Then Ashkenazi said, well, it looked like they might have stronghold now. What we'll do, we're going to go up there and let them borrow some money. They need some money, too. So they were financing both the North and the South. And then after the war was over, Abraham Lincoln was trying to shake them, get rid of them, pay them off. He, he, uh, he created the greenback so we would have our own money. Well, you know, they killed him. All right. They held the bank off for a little while. They phased this out, the green back out. And then about the time of the first World War I, they had a stronghold. They came in here, and they didn't call it the bank anymore. They called it the Federal Reserve because they said if we give it a name with name Federal, then people will think it's a government institution and not a private bank, and we'll begin to own the government of the United States. And guess who owns us now? Federal Reserve is not a government institution. Right. It's a private bank owned 
by the Ashkenazi Jews. And you see how Satan works. He's getting in there any kind of way he can. When you study World War One, World War Two, we don't have time to talk about it. I got to get ready to close. Both of those were started by the Ashkenazi Jews. When you look at the seal of David, it's really not, or the star of David, there's no such thing in the Bible as the star of David. The only thing in the Bible about David is the key of David. This was their symbol, the Ashkenazi Jews symbol, the, the serpent, the seed of the serpent. This is their symbol. It's got six star uh, points on it, six mini triangles, six sided hexagon. It's just two equilateral triangles of 60, 60, 60 degrees. All these numbers, six point to the serpent. Ain't this something? All right. So they found this in an excavation uh, in the Khazar sites up above Turkey area. All right. Before 9-11, only the following nations in the world were left without a Rothschild owned central bank. They're taking over the world. That's what I'm trying to get y'all to see. They're taking it over just like Satan would. Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, North Korea, Sudan, Cuba, and Libya were the only ones before 9-11 that didn't have one of their banks. So they put on their media because they own all the media, put in all their newspapers because they own all the newspapers, and they told us that these are the most awful people in the world. Y'all with me? Because they control what you see, what you hear. They own most of the food supply. This is what you taste. See, that's, what that's all I'm saying. We're headed toward what the scripture calls this one world government. And they're trying to get control of all of it. Well, they went into Afghanistan. They went into Iraq. And the only one left, you know, I want you all to watch now, Cuba, North Korea, and Iran. Now, you listen to the news and the Ashkenazi Jews media, and now they, they, they got Trump talking about Iran. I just, want you to, I just want you to see what's going on now. And in the effort... To get control over the whole world, which is what the Antichrist is uh, going for, is the love of money. Is it a theory? This is what David Rockefeller said. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States. Characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, he said, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. I thought about to deny it. Either. Adolf Hitler said, National Socialism will use its own revolution for the establishing of a new world order. George Herbert Walker Bush, the war in Iraq is a rare opportunity to move toward an historic period of cooperation. Out of these troubled times, a new world order can emerge. Y'all listen to what they're saying now. Whatever happens, whatever the outcome, a new world order is going to come into the world. It will be buttressed with uh, police power. When peace comes this time, there's going to be a new order of social justice. We are going to achieve a new world without paying for it in blood as well as in words and money. So, now you see what their agenda is. New world order. All of the politicians said they know what they mean. They had to say it because they've been told to say it. All right. Now, next week, we're going to talk about serving another Jesus. Paul says, but I'm afraid that even as the serpent, yeah, we just talked about the, y'all. You, know, you got to put all this together. The serpent beguiled Eve by his cunning. Your minds may be corrupted and led away from the simplicity, your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For you seem willing to allow it if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached. Or if you receive a different spirit from the one you receive, or a different gospel from the one you accepted. You tolerate all this beautifully. Welcoming the deception. Yet I consider myself in no way inferior to the so-called super apostles. Now Paul is warning us of another Jesus. And he said, man, and he was talking to the Corinthians. The Corinthians, and I'm going to close on it. The Corinthians were a Gentile people. They did everything in debauchery. 
And when they did it, they did it well. When they sinned, they sinned real good. But then they got a hold of the gospel and they were excited about the gospel. But he was worried about them just like he had been worried about Israel, that they allowed this stuff to come in that was not of God and corrupt the pureness of the gospel. And he says, it's like y'all just letting it in willingly. And so we're going to talk next week about are we serving another Jesus? Now listen to this and we'll close. He said, both Jesuses have a forerunner to announce their arrival. Both Jesuses claim a miracle birth. Both Jesuses claim to be the son of God. Both have a 40-day fast. Both Jesuses have a resurrection. Both are part of a trinity. Both have a church. And both promise eternal life. Which Jesus are you certain? We'll talk about it next week. Any questions? <laughs> so, I my, my, my question would be uh, as we look at the things that are happening right now, mm-hmm. in the world right now even with, with uh, President uh, Trump, I, I can see the things that are moving in place. Wouldn't it be ever known that the Right, because we're limited as a nation as to what we can do. Because they own the money. It's not our money, it's their money. And it's called what you call sovereign debt. And so you have to understand what sovereign Sovereign debt means there's something backing the money. So we go to the bank and we get a loan for our house. If we don't pay the loan on the house, they get the house. Right? So these people own us because we are in trillions of dollars worth of debt to them. And if it comes to time when they call us on our debt, we don't have the money to pay them. We got to give them everything we got. They own it. It doesn't matter to them whether the dollar collapsed, the economy collapsed, all that. They still own us. They can create a whole new economic system, which is what I'm saying is the beast system that's coming up. They're getting to the point now where they don't even want you to use cash in stores. Because cash is anonymous. I can go in and I can buy something anonymously with cash. They don't even want to take it. So they're going to weed cash out. But when I go in with my card, I go in and they know what I bought, where I bought it from, whether I like Cheerios or cornflakes. I mean, they know everything about you. And they can market specifically just to you. All the social media owned by Ashkenazi Jews, Facebook, Google. YouTube, Ashkenazi, everything that we do, they know. They know what we like to watch, what we like to listen to. We got digital TV now. They know what station your TV on. They got a, a, a computer system in Europe now that can run trillions of uh, bits worth, well, billions of tr- bits worth of data in like a few seconds. That means that they can get information on every individual in the world in a matter of seconds. That's a good question. The reason they do that is that they have to keep control of us. If you really look at the numbers, we're like way down on the list and everything. They say the only thing that we're number one in is thinking we're number one. <laughs> they, they, they did. That, that's true. They did a study. That's the only thing that we're number one in is thinking we're number one. Our kids don't know what the other nations know. I went to Japan. I'm talking about them third, fourth, fifth graders know more than our seniors almost in high school. They learn a different language from from day one. It's a smart kid. I'm talking about we like way down on the list for the education go.
Because that's not their main goal. Right now, we're the enforcer of the world for the Ashkenazi Jews. If they say go to war, we go to war. If they say go, and uh, uh, Saddam didn't have anything to do with 9-11. But they convinced us he did. And we sent all them troops over there. Then they went over there and left all of the equipment over there because they had another plan. I would be too much money to try to bring all our equipment back, so we're just going to leave it over there. And then the, the soldiers that they had kicked out of, the, of Iraq that was Saddam's army, all of a sudden they come back and get the equipment, and now they're ISIS. Come on, y'all. Now the few countries that are left, and I'll give you this, Libya was one of the ones that didn't have a bank. All of a sudden, Hillary Clinton and all them, they went in and, uh, you know, he was giving free education to his, uh, to his people. He was, uh, he was doing a lot of great things, a free college. Uh, uh, he would set them up in an apartment. His people loved him. Gaddafi, they loved him. Over here, the news is saying, oh, he's an awful person. He did that and that. But his people loved him. He was setting them up. And he had paid off the banks. And he was trying to convince these other nations to start a whole other currency. And then it wasn't long after that, he was dead. Why? Because they wanted to control the whole world currency. So if you want to look at what's going to happen next, look at those three nations. North Korea, Iran, and who was, who was the other one? Cuba. Yeah, we opened Cuba up, so you got to watch Cuba. I'm just saying, don't, you can't believe everything you see on the news. It's designed that way. Have you ever noticed that the only image of black people that they put out there are the worst of us? They don't mind putting the entertainers out there because they own the entertainment industry. They're, they're going to make us some money. They don't mind uplifting the athletes because they own all the sports teams. He can make me some money. But if you get an intellectual black person, put them out there, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want them up there. They won't let them on the news. They cut them down. They dog them out. They put them down because this, that's not the point. So you have to really watch who's giving you your information. And that's why the Lord said, watch what goes in. He said, because it's the mind they want. They don't pay $10 million for a 30-second commercial if it don't mess with your mind. That's what they do. Any more questions? Come in. Number one, because we're his people. And he put that on us as a sign that we're his people if we're disobedient. So as a people, we're disobedient. Our forefathers are disobedient, and we're disobedient. The odds of you, you and me getting AIDS or HIV or syphilis or gonorrhea by, by being obedient to him are very slim. So what does that tell us? We're not walking according. We go to church, but we're not walking according to his word. As a people, it's, it's, those things wouldn't happen as a people if corporately, as a people, we were doing what God wanted us to do. And we're the most one of the most religious groups there is, but we go to church and lead church to play. We come in church planning what we're going to see and, and do after we leave. But I went to church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's something that, if, if I can say it like this, I think that we're going through a formality, but we're not really praying. I mean, I, I'm 100% with you. I mean, because that's what Jesus said they were doing back in his day. We were doing as a people. He said, he said, he said, man, if I listen to what you say, it's like we're real tight. He said, because your lips are, are, are not. But your hearts are far from me. So I'm saying the right thing. And I look holy and I sound holy. But my actions are saying something totally different. Okay. And so when we look at that, that's what we're doing right now. And then you said something about praying. Okay. What was the biggest move for us made 
in the history of us moving from one level socially to the next level socially. When was that made? In the 50s and 60s, right? Because we had a movement of praying. Y'all remember the church, when they came, when Martin Luther King and all them and all the civil rights leaders wanted to do something, they came to church and prayed. They had church service. Everybody got together and prayed. They would go out because you had to be prayed up to allow somebody to hit you over the head and not hit back. I don't care what nobody said. You, you got to be pray. You got to be walking in a whole different spirit to walk down the road while somebody turned fire hoses on you and dogs on you and all that stuff. And you say, no, I'm not going to fight back. That's a totally different. That's a totally different spirit. You have to be in God in order to do something like that. But we made the greatest stride socially when we were doing that. Then he got killed. Right. And we wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years. Think about what I'm saying now. For 40 years. Exactly 40 years after Martin Luther King got killed, another black man by the name of Barack Obama. And he, from a personality standpoint, looked godly, but his actions were not godly. I love him, but his actions were not godly. You can't come up and say it's all right for a man to go in a woman's bathroom just because he identifies being a woman and say that's God. You can't do that. But we, in a lot of ways, were more dedicated to our blackness than we were our God. Y'all get what I'm saying? So he said, look, I sent somebody to you in my name. And y'all killed him. He said, but I'm going to send somebody to come in their own name. Him you will receive. See, that's where we are right now. We receive the other one. We won't see the real one. And so Barack Obama was a test to black people and white people. Barack Obama was a test to black people to see if we thought that his blackness would, would lead us out. It was a sign that we were more dependent upon government than we are on God. It was a sign that we were looking for somebody else to be our Messiah than the Messiah that he already sent. That was our test. And I think as the most part, we failed. Because we're still on the news arguing and going on. We failed. We fail. Then the white people, they failed too. Because he put the image of Jesus in front of them because that's what Jesus looked like. Right? And they couldn't stand it. That was an opportunity for them to repent so they could see their own heart and say, man, I hate them black folk. I hate them. That was the opportunity to repent because he gave everybody the opportunity to repent. And I'm talking about the white church. And they doubled down. And they said, well, we're going to put somebody, we would rather see a, a, a immoral, foul mouth. Yes. Everything that they said he was, yes. Trump represent. Yes. And we would rather put him in just to get the, get the Negro out, get the Negro yes. out. So their heart was shown as well. And they didn't repent. But the Lord said judgment begins in the house. He going to deal with his own first, y'all, before he deal with the world. And so that's what he's doing now. He's getting ready to judge. And that's why it's important for us to read scripture, especially the scripture as pertaining to Israel, so that we can begin to understand what's to come for us as a people. I know we've gone over, but I'm just trying to answer questions. So if you got to leave, please, you know, it's okay. I'm just trying to answer, answer questions. Yeah. Yeah. China's got a bank. They're not as controlled as we are, but, you know, their whole economy is, is dependent upon our economy. So they know that. They let them get a taste of stuff, cars and clothes and yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's his whole, that's the whole purpose of the tribulation period that's about to come up. Number one is to cleanse the church. You know, there's going to be a rapture. You know, and, you know, uh, unfortunately, based upon what I'm studying, and I know there's some debate about it, some of us going to be left during the tribulation period. Still saved, 
but go through the tribulation period like Israel. But there is going to be a rapture of those who have made themselves ready. There's going to be a tribulation period. The first three and a half of the tribulation period is the cleansing of the church. Because he warns the church if, he said, if you don't come out of this fake religion and fake God stuff, he said, I'm going to allow you to go through the tribulation period. So if you're saved, you're saved. I'm not saying you're not going to be saved. I'm just saying some of us are going to go through it because we won't get rid of this junk that he's asking us to get rid of. Well, at that time, and we can study this. Y'all want to get together and study this. But Ezekiel 37 is the sign. He said, I'm going to send a sign to the whole world that you're my people. He said, what's the sign? Well, there's only one sign that Jesus talks of, and that's the sign of Jonah. The resurrection of his people. You say, well, how is that so? He, in the book of Isaiah, he said, on the, on the second day, I'm going to revive you. On the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the third day, I'm going to raise you up. He talking about resurrection. But what third day from what? The third day from Jesus. The day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day been 2,000 years or two days he's, 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 he's reviving us now and there's going to be a great resurrection so the last three and a half years of the tribulation period it appears as though all of Israel is going to be raised he said I'm going to open up your graves and I'm going to raise you up all around the world in the nation where you have been held captive and he said the whole world is going to know that you're mine well I think so if you see a whole bunch of black folk come up out the grave that's the greatest sign that you can get. And it says in Isaiah, uh, I think it's the 11th chapter or 14th chapter, he said that the people are going to be taking us back to Israel. He said, man, you got to get this curse off us because he's mad at us now. Get this off of us. We got to take you back to where you belong. So, yes, it's a great question. And there's a lot of scriptures that, uh, that we could talk about, the details of it. Yeah, there's a plan for his people. He said, I have not discarded my people. Matter of fact, he's going to live with his people a thousand years on earth, and Israel will become the main nation on the earth for one thousand years. And those of us who have lived right in this on this time, we're going to rule and reign with him during that thousand years. So there's a lot. It's a lot, and I don't mind if anybody want to have a special study at their house or get together and talk about this stuff. We can do it, you know, because we need to get geared up Amen. and. Uh, you know, get some knowledge about us here. And we got to get in him to speak up because we want to we want to speak what he wants to speak and not what we what we want to speak. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad to be here this morning and just to hear the word. And I always enjoy the show. It's just enjoy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I even bring out the word and make it so plain. But one thing I paid attention to, and you know, you know, I don't have to be in the church at all. I'm trying to start even home with your own church. Yeah. That's huge, yeah. Change. You know, we have 
us. I ain't gonna come. We just don't come though. <laughs> you know, we look at these things. And we want to know where our roots. We want to know where we come from. But are we gonna do some miracles when we learn? If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. See, it's a process. And then not only just pray, because we, we get good at praying sometimes, but he said, turn, turn your wicked way. He said, at that point, you're going to hear from heaven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah. But now, now, that, now that we know, uh, yeah, exactly. Now that we know who the people are, who are he talking to? My people. Who are called by my name. See, we're the only people that got his name or had his name in our name. That's what I'm talking about. That, that scripture is for us. Gentiles didn't have his name in their name. They still don't. All right. I know we went away over, but we like to answer questions and stuff. So. But we'll be back 10 o'clock, Lord willing, next week. And uh, are we serving the right Jesus? All right, Pastor. Uh, thank you, Elder Shows. Uh, once again, if you uh, want a copy of this PowerPoint, uh, leave your name.